there are always those that bounce for the early flights. Uh, but here we are, and we've saved the really good stuff for the end. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Nambre people, uh, the traditional owners of this land, and pay my respects to their elders. And also acknowledge uh, any First Nations people in the room, um, and also everybody who's fighting to recover lost language and knowledge and culture. I am really excited uh, to be chairing this last panel with, uh, we're gonna have a bit of commentary and interjection from Corey. And the two speakers are two people who work with me in the Authors Interest Project at the University of Melbourne. And some of you here will have heard me talk about this project before. Um, it came about when I rage wrote a grant application to the Australian Research Council um, in about 2016, 2017. Um, and, and it was the same thing I was talking about this morning, that I'm just so frustrated with the, um, the way in which creators kept being used as stalking horses to protect other people's economic interests. And so the application I wrote was to say, well, what if we actually took those interests seriously? What kind of unthinking could that unlock, both to help creators get paid and to help promote widespread access to knowledge and culture. And so uh, we're now very, very deep into that project. We've been working on uh, a whole bunch of things. Uh, one of them, one of the big themes has been reversion rights, like I was talking about earlier this morning, um, which is this idea that if we can free up rights to creators to re-exploit them, then that can very obviously help both of those aims. And we're gonna be hearing from Dr. Joshua Yuvaraj, who's gonna be talking about that, and I'll introduce him properly in a moment. Uh, we've also uh, been working on the Untapped project that I alluded to, which is, hang on a minute, we've got all of this really important lost Australian culture, all these um, vitally important books that have gone out of print, and they're gonna be lost. And so many of them, I can tell you, uh, we, we worked with a, a range of library partners from around Australia, as well as the Australian Society of Authors and lots of individual authors and agents. And those books that we, we reclaimed, sometimes they were so scarce that we couldn't even find a copy to destructively scan, where we slice off the spine, run it through the scanner, do the OCR, send it to the proofreader. And actually our partners at the, 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 the state libraries were opening their libraries during COVID, during lockdowns, for staff to go in, find the precious scarce copy um, in the stacks, and then run it through the non-destructive scanner so that we could get them, which is just, like it both shows the utter importance of doing this work, but also the incredible dedication of libraries to ensuring um, access to knowledge and culture. And as I mentioned, they're not just available as eBooks, but they're now available in physical form as well. And, um, and then another big part of the project has been uh, Dan Gilbert's work here. He's a doctoral student on the project. And he's working on reconceptualizing, reconceptualizing public lending rights. So uh, we heard before that they apply to print collections. The government has just announced that it's going to extend them to, um, uh, to e-books and audio books, um, which makes it incredibly uh, prescient of Dan to have started work three years ago on figuring out how we might best go about doing that and asking really sort of deeper fundamental questions about ro what roles um, those rights might play in that space and what kind of opportunities could they um, uh, have to, to act as guard dogs. Um, and just before I, I throw to Josh to start his presentation, I wanna just mention something that I've been thinking about quite a bit um, and that was sort of reinforced by that previous panel where particularly we were hearing um, um, Kirsten talk about stewardship. And I, I did really want to have a First Nations voice on this panel, but unfortunately uh, everybody did have to leave for their flights. But stewardship rather than ownership has I think enormous potential for us as a concept in thinking through the next steps of this path to finding a way in which creators and, and institutions and users can all, um, and, and investors and intermediaries as well, can all live sustainably um, and with economic dignity. Um, 
let's be thinking about that theme of stewardship uh, as we hear what Joshua and Daniel have to say. So Josh is, uh, just, has just recently graduated uh, and he's a senior lecturer at the Auckland Law School in New Zealand at the University of Auckland. Uh, he finished his PhD in 2021 as part of the Authors' Interest Project, and he's, he's a co-authored work that has been published in very prestigious journals, including the Melbourne University Law Review and the Journal of Empirical Legal Studies. His current research interests are very broad. Josh really gets shit done. Uh, and they include copyright policy and law and technology, and he teaches contract in the LLB program at Auckland. So Josh, let's hear from you. Everyone, uh, two, one. Yep. Hi, everyone. Thank you for uh, coming and sticking to the to the end. And I'm really excited about this presentation and the stuff that that I'm sort of doing. I should start by saying I did an entire PhD on a lot of this, and so uh, I will not actually try to condense that all into you know, 15 to 20 minutes. Um, happy to sort of circulate, circulate links to my, 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 my doctoral work, which is open access. And uh, what I'm actually going to talk today about is briefly what reversion is, but then looking at what are some recent developments from the EU and then how might, or what lessons might we draw from uh, from from that, which which I think are quite interesting and, and topical, especially given we're sort of at at a as as Corey mentioned before an inflection point. Just to set the stage, actually, uh, you would if you're interested in this, I would highly recommend you read a report by the UK Intellectual Property Office, which was released on the sixth of February, where they took a deep dive to look at reversion rights and what they call contractual adjustment mechanisms, which are essentially um, uh, where the creator and the intermediary, publisher, record label can revisit the contract where the, the deal was disproportionate, say, to the subsequent success of the work. They did a deep dive into that and interviewed a lot of people, uh, stakeholders, musicians, etc. And it's a really interesting read and gives an idea of where the UK is at. So if you're interested in sort of that kind of law reform angle, I'd highly recommend you reading that. And I'll, I'll be quoting from some of the, the interviews there because I think it's quite, um, quite interesting. So, oh, sorry, I forgot I was controlling the slides. I, I, I do apologize. I thought they were um, being controlled. Uh, I will briefly explain what reversion is and, and why. Reversion is the phenomenon of creators regaining the rights that they may have assigned or licensed away to be exploited. So a writer with a book publisher, a musician with a music publisher and uh, a record label, etc. And uh, this happens in uh, mainly three ways. One of them is by enforcing contractual clauses. Second is by enforcing statutory mechanisms. And the third is by private negotiation. So they just talk and decide that you can have the rights back. That, those are the three main ways this occurs. Rebecca's kind of already touched on the rationales for reversion. And so I'm, I'm, I'm going to just you know, not, not spend too much time on that. There are discussions constantly about whether this is a, uh, whether this is a good thing or you know, not so good thing. And actually, depending on who you talk to, it's a good thing or a not, not so good thing. Um, but generally, the two rationales are we can, one, revive sort of dormant or not as exploited works, or we at least have the opportunity to do so. And secondly, we can create potential new revenue streams for creators. Okay, so again, potential is not a guarantee, but it is saying, well, here's another opportunity. I've listed a few examples there. I, I won't go through them all, but this is quite topical. Uh, one example that's not listed there is who has seen Top Gun Maverick? Okay, yeah. So you guys, you know, billion dollar grossing film. Quite, you know, I have, haven't actually seen Top Gun, uh, but I know it's, well, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. So, and, yeah, 
what many of you might not know is Paramount was actually sued last year and the lawsuit is ongoing because the heirs of the, the person who wrote the magazine article on which the whole Top Gun series is based, uh, they're suing Paramount for copyright infringement. They're saying you can't have used the movie without our consent. And they base it, base it on this uh, notion called the termination right in the US. Briefly, you are allowed to terminate copyrights unilaterally after 35 years um, or thereabouts in the US. You do that by filing a notice. They filed a notice uh, and uh, Paramount has essentially tried to, you know, uh, you know, have, have their action for copyright infringement thrown out. They were unsuccessful, so the litigation is still ongoing. But it gives you an idea, like this reversion is not a, a theory. It's intensely practical. It's enveloped musicians like Sir Paul McCartney, Duran Duran, um, and, and a whole bunch of others uh, as well. And uh, so, so it, this is, it indicates that people are fighting over, uh, fighting over their rights. So I've got a few examples there. I won't sort of go through uh, them, but uh, in, in any great detail, but uh, you can sort of Google that if you, you like or I'm happy to circulate the slides just to show that reversion is current and creators do want to get their rights back if they can. What I want to focus on though is developments in the EU and how this is quite interesting for Australia and other common law countries. Uh, Corey's talked about the directive on the copyright in the digital single market, which is uh, was passed in 2019 in the EU and sought to sort of harmonize uh, various protections and, and rights in, in, EU, in the EU nations. One of these was Article 22. Article 22 permits creators to revoke a grant of rights when there is a lack of exploitation of that grant. Now, uh, this was designed because the, uh, the concern was that creators were at an imbalance of bargaining power. And the idea being if you give them a second chance, well, you know, maybe they can, there's a lot of benefits to that in terms of, you know, additional revenue streams, availability, etc. cetera. So, uh, so that, that's kind of the idea behind Article 22. It's been implemented pretty much everywhere in the EU. There may still be some holdouts, but, uh, but it's been implemented uh, over the last couple of years. Uh, but what's interesting is viewing how it's been applied or implemented in two countries with more of a sort of a, a British copyright law heritage, Ireland and Malta. And that was kind of why I, I, I started investigating this, because I was like, oh, this is kind of interesting that, you know, you can make the argument for why Copyright laws in, say, France are significantly different to Australia and the UK, but with, with Ireland and Malta, there's significant commonality. So I had a look at how they've been implemented. And what's, uh, so sorry, here's just the, um, you know, here, here's the, the kind of the rationale from recital 80, so you, know, you can look at this if you'd like. So what I found was quite interesting, and there are three takeaways which I'll, which I'll get to as to, you know, when, we, when I finish analyzing the, um, the legislation, but it's quite interesting to see where they got things right and then where they've got things maybe not so right. So in Ireland, what they've done is they have put in a, a Regulation 29 of these 2021 regulations and they've said you can revoke it. Where, what I've highlighted there is where there is no exploitation of that work or other protected subject matter. Now, that is problematic because it uses the phrase no exploitation rather than lack of exploitation. And what that means is that the threshold for someone to get their rights back uh, is very, very high. All the publisher or who the intermediary has to do is say, say, well, we've put a copy online somewhere at virtually no cost to them, uh, and they can hold on to the rights. Now, uh, I looked at, tried to find out why this was the case, and I couldn't find out why they had made this deviation from the text of Article 22, which says lack of exploitation. Okay, so there's no explanation for why the Irish drafters deviated from that. And they might think, well, this is just a small thing. It's, it's huge, and it's intensely problematic, I would argue. Uh, so, um, so, so the, the Irish government departments, they're you know, their information on the websites is just non-existent on this point. And so for me, you know, that was, that was a, a bit of a red flag. 
Secondly, Article 22 lists a whole bunch of uh, additional specifications which member states may want to do. And this is quite sensible. The EU directive is not going to be prescriptive about a, you know, it must be this long and et cetera, right? Obviously, different jurisdictions have different interests and needs. And, and so what the directive says, well, you can consider all these things. Uh, so what they say is you can exercise it after a reasonable time following the conclusion of the license or transfer of rights, and you need to set an appropriate deadline for, by which the exploitation of the rights is to take place. So the idea is you can't just say, oh, you've not used the rights, I have to get, I, I can take them back. You've got to say, well, you've got until, I don't know, six months from now to uh, exploit them, and if you don't, then I'll, I'll take the rights back. Okay, so quite sensible in terms of reaching a balance. Uh, only problem is, Ireland went and implemented that pretty much word for word. So they say the right of revocation may only be exercised after a reasonable time following the conclusion and uh, shall notify the person to whom the rights have been licensed or transferred and set an appropriate deadline. Now, the obvious question is, A, what's a reasonable time? B, what's an appropriate deadline? Nobody knows, there's no explanation. Uh, you could say, well, it's by reference to sector practices, but there's none of that anywhere, and so if anyone's looking for that, well, what's reasonable and what's appropriate? And the problem with that is that, what happens if you go to your publisher and say, hey, you haven't exploited the works, I, I want the rights back, and the publisher says, well, you haven't given me a reasonable time. So it's creating the opportunity for dispute, and that may disincentivize the use of this, of this right, because if you have to potentially fight your publisher, uh, then you might say, well, it's just not worth it. Okay, so that was one of the problems with Ireland, just the general lack of specificity. Malta fared slightly better. Malta said uh, continuous lack of exploitation for five years. So again, there's a problem of, well, what's a lack of exploitation? But at least they put like a, a time period there. And they've said the time limit for rectifying lack of exploitation is six months or 12 months for sound recordings, okay? So that's, you know, at least there's some thresholds there. However, I still couldn't find how they calculated these, uh, you know, deadlines or timelines. They said there were six submissions to the public consultation process. They didn't make any of the submissions public. I found one from Wikimedia Commons, and all, you know, the only part of this that was referenced there was, well, do you think there should be a time for the lack of exploitation? And Wikimedia Commons said five years, no explanation. Again, we just don't know why they reached these thresholds, and we so. It, what that means is we just can't evaluate, well, what were they designed to do? Why five years, why six months, why 12 months? So that was another problem uh, that, I, that I found. The last problem or last issue that I identified was quite significant because Malta says, sure, you can exercise a revocation right, but you have to refer it to the copyright board for determination. You can't just unilaterally revoke it. It has to go to this body to determine whether you can revoke your right. Now, there's two problems with that. One, it doesn't fit with the author protective intentions because the whole idea is let's empower creators to regain their rights. Two, it's inconsistent with Article 22. Article 22 is about unilateral empowerment. It isn't about imposing a third party arbiter on this, right? It's not saying, well, you may be able to re uh, revoke your rights if someone else says so. No, you can do it. That's the reason why we have this provision in the first place. Again, no clear explanation why they deviated from Article 22 in, in doing this. Uh, and it's, it's, uh, yeah, it's just not clear. Now, the exception to this is in the case of collective works. So if they've been you know, co-authored and things like that, then you may need a third party arbiter, sorry, to uh, adjudicate. Say one co-author wants to terminate and another doesn't. Okay, and th there is a discussion about what's the appropriate mechanism for that. Uh, so, uh, you know, that, that's, I'll, I'll leave that for another time. But with the sole authored works, that's really problematic. And again, no explanation for that. So there are three takeaways, I would say, or lessons when considering, well, what would make an optimal uh, legal reversion mechanism, so in the law. One is open information, kind of showing how these decisions were made, because that enables us to evaluate them. So for example, making the submissions uh, open, 
passing things in legislation, perhaps, rather than all regulations, because that opens it to parliamentary scrutiny. You've got Hansard, et cetera. Uh, so again, it's just that transparency point that will help people to have a bit more confidence in why we decided to do this. The second thing is to have really clear, specific exploitation thresholds, just so everyone's clear. What does lack of exploitation mean for books? What does it mean for songs? Uh, how long applies for, for these periods? And what I've argued in my thesis, and Rebecca and I have, have talked about as well, is we can develop these thresholds in consultation with all members of creative industries so that everyone is contributing and we can decide together, at, hopefully, kind of what we all agree is a, uh, you know, a reasonable time to exploit and et cetera. So, and, and we can regularly review these um, thresholds to ensure they're continually fit for purpose. So that's the second takeaway. Mm, excuse me. And the third is simply removing unnecessary hurdles procedurally to exercising revocation rights. For example, putting a copyright arbiter there. Like, why do we need an arbiter to uh, mediate disputes about revocation, right? Why, if, if that doesn't fit the, the rationale of protecting authors? Uh, some restrictions are necessary and procedures are necessary and that kind of you know, needs to be developed but looking at Malta we can see well that probably isn't, um, isn't necessary. We can also see in the US actually that system I mentioned earlier that Top Gun Maverick was affected by, that system has been criticized for having very difficult formalities to comply with um, and Corey you'll know people who you know in, in the US entertainment industry that it's customary to hire an uh, you know, termination lawyer to help you with this process because it's just too hard. And in fact, I'm looking at the case law at the moment about termination rights and you can see that there's been challenges to termination notices. Oh, he didn't put the date right here. She didn't specify which grant she's referring to, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All of that can disincentivize people because A, I don't want to spend the time and money to successfully re regain my rights might not be worth it. B, I don't want to have to fight these massive companies to regain my rights. Um, and work that Rebecca and I and a couple of others have done on the termination right suggests that uh, record labels in particular quite fiercely fight to regain, uh, so to stop creators regaining their rights. So removing undue procedural hurdles is key. Uh, I've, I've got listed a couple of the sort of the key key works here on which this is based. I'm happy to, if you've got any further questions on reversion rights, I'm happy for you to contact me by email. Uh, but yeah, those are the three takeaways that I would propose for uh, anyone considering reversion rights, like the UK and uh, Canada and potentially Australia as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, right, so I'm now gonna throw to Corey for comment, and exactly as I was hoping, he was vibrating uh, <laughs> at various points there with, ah, oh. So Corey, can I get your thoughts on that? And also, uh, any musings that you have? On, we've heard a lot about some questionable reversion uh, um, systems there. Your thoughts on what makes for a good one as well? Uh, I, oh, good, my mic is on. I thought there, it, it had switched itself off. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, so uh, you said you, you, couldn't, you didn't know why the systems were so baroque uh, and why the, the, they had arrived at these arbitrary figures that made it so hard. And I said to Rebecca, I have an idea why, right? And I think we all have an idea why, that, that this is about industrial policy that um, is reaching a goal that favors the interests of one party against the evidence and against the parliamentary intent. And, um, in the break, I was, I was talking with someone about this, that uh, the initial intent of competition law uh, in the, the US and then in most of the rest of the world, because it arises around the same time during the Gilded Age, was not merely to make sure consumers got a good deal, but, but it, there was a recognition that if you were to have good rules, you would have to have firms that didn't have so much power that they could distort the rules. And that if you have a rulemaking, which is to say a truth-seeking exercise that's meant to be adversarial, that if you have lots and lots of parties that are there, right? So if we can imagine a, a, a rulemaking procedure about termination. You could imagine that there might be firms that would benefit from termination by, by acquiring rights out of termination and reselling them. There might be firms that would, uh, uh, that would have a problem because of termination because they would lose the rights to works that they might um, someday be able to exploit or were currently exploiting in the US case, and that um, they would act as checks on each other. 
they would be able to present evidence that really represented um, uh, live industrial experience. Right? And, and if one of them sort of over the pudding, the other one could show up and say, it's not true. I can tell you it's not true. The problem is that when an industry dwindles down to a handful of firms, you don't get a, an adversarial truth-seeking exercise. You get an auction. And um, you know, this is uh, unambiguously good policy. There's, there's just not really any basis for saying, especially in the European context, uh, leaving aside the American one here, that a work that's, that, that has no commercial life, there's really no argument either in the sort of French author's rights conception or a more utilitarian Anglo-American conception. There's no argument to say that this, that this should just ling linger, linger or languish. There's no, no one benefits from that except for a firm that can cheaply amass a portfolio of speculative assets on the off chance that one of them has a, an economic life somewhere way down the line. And you know the, the interesting thing about the countries that are struggling with these policies, uh, Malta and Ireland, is that they are also countries that have struggled with other European policies. So you know, famously, there's a lot of bad odor about the GDPR, uh, which is Europe's landmark privacy regulation. There are parts of the GDPR I think are problematic, like the right to be forgotten, which is turned into a charter for war criminals to purge uh, uh, news archives of correct and factual accounts of their crimes. But um, the, the part about the affirmative consent for privacy is a really good bedrock, and again, commonsensical idea. And it's not like it's, it's got a drafting error, right? It, 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 it's, it's, the tin is very clearly labeled, and so what's in the tin should, should be what it says. And the problem has been that um, all of the firms that uh, it affects most uh, sharply maintain the fiction that their headquarters is in Ireland, because Ireland is a tax haven. And so Ireland permits um, profit shifting. And it's no coincidence that in Ireland, you have a data commissioner who hears 17 cases a year, whereas in Germany they hear 500, right? The Irish data commissioner like barely gets out of bed in the morning. They don't put on trousers. They sit around all day eating cereal and watching cartoons, right? <laughs> and the reason that no one makes them stop, that no one makes them hear these cases is the same reason that you can maintain the corporate fiction that all of your profits are be re being realized in a state of untaxable grace hovering somewhere over the Irish Sea in international waters. Uh, the fact that Malta sells golden passports is not unrelated to the fact that Malta is a place where industrial actors can suborn the regulatory process to produce regulation that undermines the intent of, of uh, European uh, regional, region-wide regulation. The, these are like closely related. And so uh, I was saying yesterday when we visited the Attorney General that um, the Attorney General's office. Uh, office, beg your pardon, yes. Uh, that we spent a lot of, that I used to spend a lot of time talking to culture ministers and culture regulators. And these days I spend a lot more time talking to competition regulators. Because it seems to me that a lot of these questions are downstream of power. That you can write any law you want, but the enforcement of the law really turns on the ability to do it. And I'll, I'll close by telling you a story out of the annals of antitrust. Um, the IBM. Uh, operated an unlawful business with all kinds of predatory conduct that eventually resulted in 1970 with the Department of Justice bringing a case against IBM seeking to unwind certain mergers and force them to divest of certain divisions uh, as the only way by which they could be assured of, of playing clean. That they had, they had formed, they had repeatedly sinned, and it became clear that they just couldn't operate two adjacent lines of business without cross-subsidizing them through anti-competitive conduct, right? You know, you've, you've demonstrated you can't play with your toys. I'm taking them away and putting them on the shelf. And so IBM spent the next 12 years, every year consecutively, spending more on outside antitrust counsel than the entire Department of Justice antitrust division. They outspent the US government, right? And then the, after 12 years, the DOJ let them off the hook. And the way they outspent the US government, the way they had the money to outspend the US government, is they had a monopoly, right? So they amassed monopoly rents, and they used the monopoly rents to prevent the demonopolization of their firm. Um, and we, we, this was um, the, not the beginning, but the, or not the end, but the beginning of a new era on antitrust in which we shifted to a tolerance for monopoly formation on the assumption that most monopolies were very efficient and would deliver consumer benefits, and that we should only break them up after they've been shown to be harmful. And the IBM example really shows why that's not a, a valid enforcement theory. 
uh, not because you can't tell when a monopoly is harmful after the fact, but by the time it has a monopoly, it's very hard to break them up. Uh, not least because they can enlist a bunch of stakeholders to show up and say, as bad as our situation is with this firm, if they were to go away, there'd be no one else to step in and fill the vacuum, and we'd be left just dangling uh, uh, in midair, and we would have no, no future. And so even the firms that they abuse and the suppliers that they abuse will often show up and brief for them. So I think that this is a story about corporate power, even though it's really a story about termination. And uh, because Corey's been talking a lot in the last eight days, we've worked him very hard. Um, I'm going to answer the second part of my question myself. Uh, what makes for a good termination oh, law or a good sorry. reversion law? Uh, that's all right. You, you, you take a break. I'm going to work you again when, when Dan's had his go. And then you're off duty. All right. Uh, so um, we know what makes for, for a good termination law. So uh, laws that are certain, okay, so that there's not... Um, ambiguity that required that needs to be um, settled via litigation. We still don't know, even though the US termination law was enacted in 1976, we still don't know really key critical points about how it works. And people, most people don't have the money to test it. The people who do have the money to test it get uh, confidential settlements so that it doesn't go to litigation and there's no precedent that can help anybody else. So we know from that we need to have certainty. Um, France, for example, has got a, uh, a special revision law for publishing contracts and it just says if the book's been out for this amount of time and you haven't received any royalties for this amount of time, you can send a letter, you've got the rights back, boom. All right? um, we also need to um, ensure that w like we're sort of sensitive to the ways in which um, creators need to exercise these because there's understandable fears of blackballing. Um, so we've got to think about the ways in which the rights work and the way that they operate. Uh, we need to keep the costs low, so certainty high, cost low, um, and there's a bunch of other stuff in our research that you can have a look at. But there are, you know, there's so many different models to draw upon, and a lot of them do just without fuss work well. And where that happens is where they haven't been suborned by corporate power, determined to make sure that they don't work properly at all. All right, so we'll throw to broader questions uh, soon, but first we're going to hear from um, Dan, um, who's going to talk to us about his work reconceptualizing public lending rights. So Dan also, of course, works with me on the public uh, in the Authors' Interest Project. He's really interested in the relationship between law and creative practice, and the impacts and opportunities that arise from different models of remuneration and access in digital environments. His current research focuses on the potential of libraries to facilitate a new balance between access for readers and payments for authors. Thanks, Dan. Cool. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, so as Rebecca mentioned, I'm, uh, my talk concerns uh, the topic of lending rights, which are payments made to authors for the use of works in libraries. Um, the historical position against which these rights emerged, or the context, was at the height of the public library movement, when the um, funding of libraries uh, through kind of varied and um, uh, disparate uh, mechanisms, some of them private, uh, some of them um, commercial, sort of all got behind um, the one mechanism that we know very well today, uh, public funding, um, in order to uh, create the institution that we now know as the public library. Um, as these institutions rose in their capacity, uh, fears um, naturally began to emerge amongst authors that they would eat into the sales uh, of books on the market. It's against that concern that Denmark, in the year of 1946, passed the first lending right, outside of copyright, a right to remuneration that preserved the relationship that um, libraries, um, the, the relationship between libraries and copyright as a counterweight to copyright's exclusive rights uh, which are founded on the promise of uh, providing incentives and re uh, for production of works and uh, of rewarding authors for the production of those works, but, no, uh, but make no guarantee of that payment. They leave the actual uh, provision of those rewards to the uh, function of the market. Lending rights are very different uh, because they're inalienable in most cases. Um, they're inalienable because they're founded not on the concept of rights, but on the concept of eligibility. And I'll move into that in a moment. But before I talk about the nuances of what a lending right is and why it differs from copyright and why it ought to differ from copyright, I'm going to talk briefly about why I'm telling you all this. Why am I telling you all this? Um, so lending rights in Australia are ex uh, have become 
uh, a vital source of support for authors um, in an increasingly uh, precarious market. Um, when I started this PhD, they constituted the uh, third most important support for authors, uh, just after um, royalties and advances. Um, now they're the second most important source of support, just after uh, royalties. Um, they're quite a lot, in, in, in one sense, they're quite a lot like cultural support uh, of a kind with grants, prizes, pensions, um, and uh, fellowships, in the sense that they're nationally funded and they tend to uh, derive their public um, value proposition from the expectation of a national return, right? Uh, unlike copyright, which is uh, uh, paid to authors on the basis of their sales on the market, lending rights are generally speaking restricted to authors from the nation that funds them. Usually they do this in one of two ways, on the basis of either holdings, the number of books that are on library shelves, which can be seen to function as a proxy for lending rates, um, or a value in its own right, or on the basis of library lending, how many times the book goes out to a borrower. They're pretty basic in principle, but what these rights have actually been used to do transcends greatly that uh, compensatory rationale on which they were initially um, put forward. Today, lending rights across the world uh, ascribe particular values to certain kinds of works. They rule out other kinds of works. I'll talk about them in greater depth uh, in a little bit. But, excuse me for a moment. We heard earlier that the Australian government has released the cultural policy, uh, its recent cultural policy, and that it's planning to extend lending rights into the digital space. On one hand, there's never been a stronger case for this. Uh, digital lending, uh, especially after COVID, has become an increasingly important part of what libraries do and an increasingly um, important um, avenue through which uh, borrowers um, are able to access these works. On the other hand, Digital lending fundamentally changes the paradigm against which lending rights uh, were first created. Uh, whereas in the context of analo the analog lending, the lending of physical books, uh, a library uh, provides a, a book to a borrower, none of an author's rights are invoked. There's no uh, requirement to obtain permission and there's no capacity to prohibit that activity. Equally, uh, there's no uh, requirement under copyright, as in under the uh, laws that a, an author can expect anywhere in the world under the framework of uh, obligations and, and rights that uh, uh, under the Berne Convention and TRIPS and so forth. There's uh, no expectation, sorry, there's no provision uh, for authors to be able to preclude that to occur. So it happens at the uh, option of national governments and it happens only when uh, governments put forward the funding to do that. What that means is that li uh, library lending, whether paid or not, uh, occurs. The default position is that library lending goes on. That's why in nations like America, which don't have a lending right, library lending simply continues on outside of the control of copyright. Lending, this makes lending rights sui generis. They're not like exceptions to copyright, where you know it's accepted that this falls within the general conception of something that would uh, typically belong to an author and typically fall within an author's capacity or a copyright owner's capacity um, to preclude the public from accessing uh, in exchange for the capacity to hopefully obtain a fee. They're instead something that we do on top of that framework, um, something that we do on top of an activity that remains a crucial part of the public domain, a crucial counterpoint to copyright uh, and its promise to increase uh, the, the production of works, but it, it's uh, um, but it, uh, yeah. uh, a crucial counter, counterweight to copyright. When we move into the digital domain though, something fundamental changes, which is that unlike the, uh, the passage of a physical book from a library to a library page, patron, or the consultation on library premises of a, a library book by a, a library patient, patron. Um, the physical transfer of a book to the device uh, 
of um, a library borrower uh, necessitates that a copy is made in the process. What that means is that unlike the physical dealing with the book, which concerns the, in the corporeal object, uh, the, the physical piece of property, but not the incorporeal work um, in which copyright is imbued, when a digital work is transferred, a copyright uh, owner's rights or an author's rights are invoked. And what that means is that it creates a point in the process at which copyright owners are able to authorise, prohibit, set terms, set prices, uh, basically determine the nature from that point onwards of how that work is interacted with. Something that fundamentally changes the nature of what a library is and maybe even challenges the conception of whether a library remains a library in that scenario, or is it a portal? And what's the distinction anyway? There's a second, I mean, there's a convergence in two ways. There's a convergence on one hand between the function of the library and the market. There's a convergence in an, on another hand between the function of lending and rental, which I'll get into in a moment. And then there's a second, uh, there's a third convergence, sorry, I missed one, um, between the notion of the sale and the transfer of, and the dealing with the uh, copyright in the work. Because when I hand you a physical work, I'm able to engage with you in just the physical world without engaging with that kind of abstract conception of, of, a, of a right over a particular use of that work. But when I transfer you a file, there's no capacity for me to make a sale to you. It's not possible for me to sell you a book without selling the copyright. It's as if in a bookstore, I sold you the book and I also sold you the copyright. I, also, yeah, I couldn't sell you a book without getting the clearance from the author. These various issues create challenges to what a library is and what a library does. And what I want to say, and the core point of what I want to say, is that when we look at what lending rights have done in the past, and we look at what they do today, and we look at how we adapt them for the future, we need to take that into account. We need to take that into account because if lending rights of the past were designed to compensate authors for some loss uh, that was presumed to occur, never proven to occur, but presumed to occur because of uh, the activities of libraries, um, the idea that free means loss, uh, then when we move them into the digital domain, this logic no longer, no longer applies. Theoretically, at least, authors have provided a fully exclusive light, a right to prohibit that activity. Um, in practice, what happens is, of course, that right is sold to the copyright holder. The problem with rights, as opposed to eligibility-based payments, or maybe not the problem, but the difference, rather, is that rights can only, generally speaking, be sold once to a powerful party. Um, in the case of ineligibility, this, this means that copyright derives a lot of its value from its rigidity, right? Rights have uh, their value to future, uh, to the purchaser because of the longevity of those rights. It's why they lie, yeah, uh, it's why the terms are so valuable. They're valuable to somebody, or they have the appearance of value. Contrast that with lending rights, which are, which are provided uh, uh, in a way, uh, they're provided optionally by uh, the nations that provide them, but they can often be large pools of money. What's interesting about them um, in addition to their relationship uh, to this sort of third entity, this mysterious, uh, you know, institution that is neither state nor market, is that they are constantly shifting, they're constantly changing, they're constantly defined by the context, uh, cultural, linguistic, economic, in which they're situated. A good lending right in one country will not be a good lending right in another country. For example, in English language markets like Australia, a good lending right uh, may simply be confined to uh, nationals of this country. It may uh, have nothing more uh, added to it. Whereas a good lending right in a nation like Denmark uh, might, look, might be confined to Danish language works, which is the state of play in that nation. A lending right with a high budget, which ours is, I think, a relatively high budget. It's about $22 million for the public lending right component, um, a, a nation with a, a large lending right can afford to simply make payments against a metric like holdings or against uh, a metric like lendings without having to set any caps or brackets or tiers of payment. But in a nation like Canada, which has a smaller amount of funding per person, um, the, Im the implementation of a cap can mean that funding is distributed in a way that fundamentally differs from the market. In nations like Denmark, they go further. 
they add layers of complexity that are difficult to explain, but functionally work to ensure that uh, money is redistributed from the highest earners to the bottom brackets, spreading that money out in a thoughtful way that differs, again, greatly from the market. One of the things I want to uh, suggest very strongly uh, is that as we think about moving these rights into the digital domain, and, and we very much should, uh, we should be thoughtful about the sorts of things we uh, decide to produce, reproduce, and detract from. Um, should we be, uh, with public funding, reproducing effects that are already um, uh, produced by the market? Should we be seeking to uh, offset them? Should we be seeking to elevate voices that are not represented um, by the market? These are just considerations. Uh, and there are various ways that we can do these things. Um, we can provide different rates to authors writing about or from particular backgrounds uh, that are not well represented in the, in the market. We can provide uh, particular rates, higher rates, to people writing about particular subjects that are in dire need of discussion. We can uh, play around with time frames. <laughs> There's a lot of different uh, faders that we can move in relation to these things, and countries do it. Um, the other thing we can do with these rights, and that we should do with these rights, is, that to, is to pay attention to the power dynamic shift uh, as, that, that occurs naturally from the translation into digital copyright. So we're, as previously, we were providing these uh, public payments uh, in relation to a sort of exchange, a tacit exchange. Uh, it was a sort of recognition that, um, you know, the, the public was, was gaining access to these works, that the library was doing an important uh, job in providing that access, but that authors were not uh, benefiting directly from that. When we move into the digital space, uh, we should consider whether, uh, oh, so in the Australian paradigm, uh, we pay publishers 25% of, of the rate that we pay to authors. I think when we move into the digital domain, we have to seriously question that relationship, because the capacity of the publisher to set the initial rate uh, provided to the market fundamentally shifts the power dynamic, and uh, the access models, importantly, which I forgot to mention and I apologize for, the access models that they can choose uh, shift the dynamic into a, a functionally streaming-like um, situation, where instead of, you know, one copy goes to one user, is returned, library retains it, uh, instead readers, uh, libraries can be charged per, um, uh, uh, for metered access of the work, and works can explode after a particular period of time, um, meaning that the library can hold onto a work that is not borrowed at any point, still be charged for it, and be left with nothing. We need to take these things into account when we consider whether the parties that negotiate the terms of these agreements, uh, or that have the power to uh, sign onto them or not, are paid that rate. And I am putting forward the argument that we should, in fact, uh, make them conditional in that situation. After all, lending itself has become conditional. In the past, it wasn't. Whether you give a lending right to a, uh, whether a nation provides a lending right or not, library lending moves on anyway. But in the paradigm of today, in the context of digital copyright, lending has become conditional, and I believe that these payments, I believe there's a strong argument to be made that they themselves should be predicated on conditions, at least to publishers, uh, that try to, that, that endeavour to use them as a lever to do nothing more insidious than get copyright to do what it says it does, which is pay authors. Um, things that we could plug in to lending rights are rights of reversion. We could have the mandatory minimum, uh, sorry, we could have mandatory minimum terms of contract in there that state, you know, that if, uh, like, have bestseller clauses. Um, that revert rights back to authors if they signed a, a deal that no, you know, is not reflected in the remuneration that they get later because they sub subsequently became famous. Or we could have uh, rights that require uh, the publisher to provide a one copy, one user license to libraries so that they have a functional equivalent of what they at least used to have uh, in the context of physical lending. Uh, we could provide minimum rates of payment specified in there uh, that, it could, that uh, on the provision of which to, uh, sorry, we could require publishers to make minimum payments to authors uh, 
for eligibility under these schemes. And of course, we could tie them to the provision of reasonable uh, royalty statements. Um, that's probably the, the crux of it. I just, we could get tied into life plus 70 years of making up for copyrights failures to do what it says it's going to do. And uh, my, my plea is that we don't. Heck yes. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Dan, talking about uh, how we can shape these public lending rights and this amazing opportunity we've got now under Revive to think about what are the carrots and sticks we want to use to get more of what we need in exchange for these new payments in order to help authors and access. Corey, reactions? Um, so I, I think that something that Dan said that really struck me is this idea that because a transient copy is made during a, an e-lending, that we throw away the traditional framework and we move it back to uh, a EULA-based uh, negotiation. And you know, for me, the, the expansion of EULAs is just facially unfair uh, in every domain, but especially in books, right? Like That's the it. end user license end user agreements license for agreement, those of you who are playing yeah. acronym bingo. That's right. So you know, it, it is it is uh, absurd, really, that anytime you do something on the internet, you click through an agreement that says, you know, by being foolish enough to do this, you agree that I'm allowed to come over to your house and punch your grandmother, wear your underwear, make long distance calls, and eat all the food in your fridge. And the idea that just you know, merely glancing in that direction or scrolling down through a box and clicking I agree uh, it, it forms an agreement is bad enough on its face. But it's especially bad in the case of books. Uh, Books have this weird and interesting cultural baggage that redounds to the benefit of authors and publishers. Books are special, um, but, and libraries are special as well. Books are obviously older than copyright. They're actually older than printing. They're older than binding. They're older than paper. Right? Books are very, very, very old. And libraries are older than both. Mm -hmm. Say again? Libraries are older than both. Libraries are older than both, correct, yes. And if you wanted to, you know, if you're a a hack student filmmaker and you want to quickly sh thumbnail the collapse of civilization, you just show a bunch of books on fire, right? We, we, we think about destroying books the way we think about eating dogs, right? There's just this kind of moral repugnance to it. And there is this like incredible danger that if we treat books as just another object of commerce, right? If we say, oh, well, you know, it's a, when, it, when we digitize an object of commerce, it's bound by a EULA and the EULA can say anything that the that the proprietor wants to stick in it, and by you know w waving your hand in the direction of the EULA, you assent to all of its terms. Then we have the danger that it'll work, right? Like the only thing worse than it failing is it working, right? And people coming to treat books as um, you know mere objects of commerce, as something no more and no less important than tea towels or socks or any of the other things that you can buy in a bookstore. None of which you treat with the importance and reverence that you do the books that you take home from the shop. And so I'm, I'm very concerned that this, is the, that this is what's happening. And I think that there is a political opportunity here to bring together a coalition around the unfairness of unilateral terms more generally. Um, there are some legal scholars in the US who propose that um, uh, we could form a, a, a nationwide uniform commercial code. There is a kind of nascent nationwide uniform commercial code that puts limits on contracting and that sets out the standard terms when you buy, when you buy goods, the, 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 contract to, the contractual terms between a buyer and a seller for a non-negotiated adhesion contract. And one legal proposal has been that you have to give buyers the chance to choose between either the standard deal or the bespoke deal. And that buyers should have the, the um, unilateral right to just tick a box that says, I don't agree to your terms, I agree to the standard terms. Because one of the arguments for the non-standard terms is that it produces a better outcome. Well, it only produces a better outcome if it can be negotiated. And it can only be negotiated if it's not a take it or leave it contract, if there's an alternative. And I wonder, you know, even if we're going to say that we're not going to treat e-books like books, and that we're going to treat them like mere objects of commerce, we can still say, well, we should, we should regulate that commerce with some conception on the one hand to the basic fairness that all commerce should entail, we should treat the uh, 25 years of shrink wrap licenses as the aberrant uh, phenomenon that they are. And, it, and we should also recognize the sui generis nature of books and the ancient compact that goes into books. This morning I mentioned the idea that in music you can record a cover of someone else's music. There's no like copyright sense in which this makes any bit of sense. Right? If you were designing a copyright system from scratch, 
and you had a new art form like video games. There's no video game right to make someone else's video game and put your name on it and pay a compulsory license. With music, there's just no question that you have that right to do it because it's something that everyone has always done in music. Musicians have always performed each other's songs, right? And so we can say there's a, a distinct character, a cultural character to books that, as you say, is very old, and libraries that's very old, that predates you know, um, all modern civilizations, and that we're gonna retain that into the digital era and put limits on, on this that um, can act as a, a way to enshrine some of those rights that libraries need and to ease our way into a basis for a lending right that is different from the other kinds of distributions that we make. Fantastic, thank you so much. And we still have some questions, oh, time for questions, which is fantastic. We've got eight minutes there. Uh, who was listening? <laughs> Here we go. At least to this beginning. Hi, um, my name's Jenny. I just want to ask a question about reversion rights. You were talking very much focused on reversion where there has been a lack of exportation. Um, and I just want to ask a further question about whether um, you think it's good to have, legisla have possible legislation that has an automatic reversion right after a period of time, whether or not there has been exportation, or whether the law could also include um, provision for... Um, claiming reversion of rights where there has been exploitation but it's been predatory and detrimental to the creator. Thanks, thanks for that, Jenny. Um, yeah, that's a really, really good point. Uh, one thing I uh, didn't get to mention but should have mentioned is there are, th there's a wide range of reversion rights currently in force around the world. So part of my doctoral research involved looking at the copyright laws of all the UN member states um, and, and, and so there's this rich tapestry or variety of all the kinds that you're talking about. So, for example, an automatic time limit um, in Indonesia, for example, it's sort of if you've not, if, if it's a lump sum grant, it expires after 25 years. So, you know, we, we, we have that. Uh, we also have the lack of exploitation stuff and, and some quite uh, interesting ones in, for example, Lithuania and Spain, uh, rights in unused languages. Uh, for books, those uh, if if you don't use them after five years, they can they they go back to the the creator, which is quite a quite a useful thing when you're thinking about book contracts that may, for example, say all languages or you know a lot of languages. So, a I think that there is some benefit in terms of the automatic reversion. There are potential issues to iron out. For example, if it automatically goes back to the creator, but the creator doesn't know about it, or you know, we get to a similar sort of orphan work problem in the sense of like, well, who owns it? And maybe Re the cultural steward point Rebecca made earlier today is a useful, a useful uh, point to that. Um, and and that, that's a point raised in the UK's uh, UK IPO's uh, report on that. Well, it's, it's something that they need to consider. Uh, to your point about the predatory exploitation, I, I think that's definitely something that would fall under the um, lack of or inappropriate exploitation threshold, and it, great care would need to be taken to properly define the thresholds against which creators could then regain their rights. And it's really important to not see publishers or uh, intermediaries necessarily as the enemy because they play a vital role in, uh, in the market, or however distorted the market is. Uh, they, they still can play a vital role, and so we need to s view it not as, you know, like an adversarial system, but saying, well, you're not using this, why don't we take it back? And if you still want it, we can renegotiate the rights, but let's do it kind of, uh, you know, let, let's give creators th that option. So I, I'd say yes tentatively, but certainly there are issues that would need to be ironed out at the impact analysis stage. Thank you, Josh. And do we see Vanessa? This is me. Um, my question's uh, for Dan, so uh, we'll go the other way. The educational lending right, uh, the reports are always run on holdings. Mm -hmm. We're quite, I'm interested in your thoughts. You may have, you touched on it, I think, in your talk, about bundling and the academic publishers like to bundle so you don't get any choice in the suite that you get. So we may have a lot extra that we never chose to have in the library. We've got them because they come part of the bundle. Mm. You know, I, 
in educational lending rights and, and, the, and the sort of business models that, that uh, stand behind them, it's just a, it's become something that I've um, largely stopped looking into because it's a fundamentally different question and because the, the relationship um, historically still warranted a lending right um, for each, for both the public and educational facet of, of each of these um, rights. But going into the digital space, uh, I'm not really sure, I, I, re I can't really speak to those issues because I've been limiting my exposure to them because I think that's a second thesis is what I'm trying to say. I'm sorry. <laughs> So uh, Dan's signing up for a second PhD with me, <laughs> and this time looking at ELOs. I just add that in, in antitrust theory, bundling is generally considered as guilty until proven innocent. That, that it, you know, it's called tying. And it was the source of the consent decree that forced um, the movie studios to divest themselves of their movie studio holding, their movie theater holdings. Um, it's what got IBM in trouble with the Department of Justice. Uh, it's what got Microsoft in trouble with the Department of Justice. And I think that it's a very dangerous thing, right? It's a way, it's a way not just to exploit uh, customers, but also to exclude new market entrants because you can force um, uh, uh, customers to take something that's a substitute, an inferior substitute for a, a new market entrance goods as part of a, a non-negotiable bundle, which even though it's an inferior substitute, they're unlikely to buy the new market entrance goods because they already have something. So if you've got you know, the journal of abstruse neuropathology that everybody wants, but you've also got the journal of, uh, of, of uh, you know, quite useful studies that, um, is, is, that is not a very good journal, and, but everybody who gets the one also gets the other, then someone else who starts a rival journal of quite useful studies will just not find any libraries that have any budget left over to buy their, their uh, journal. And so it just reduces the quality of scholarship. I think that prudent regulation should just start with the, with, uh, uh, the presumption that um, tying should be prohibited and then force vendors to prove otherwise. I am now just dying to start a new open access interdisciplinary journal of quite useful studies. <laughs> uh, do we have any more questions? We've got time for one more to finish us off. It has to be very good. Speak now or forever hold your peace. We've solved everything, or at least we've got plenty of food for thought. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you so Thanks, much Rebecca. to these panelists. Thank you to Corey for your um, thoughts and everybody for so graciously listening at the end of a very long day. <laughs>